Hello, and welcome to episode 48 of the DX Mentor. Thank you for joining us. I'm Bill, AJB. My guest tonight is Dave, AA6YQ, and we will be discussing his groundbreaking suite of software products known as the DX Suite. We're doing this podcast a bit differently. Although we tried to make this a true podcast where you would not need to view slides and information, the best results are obtained when reviewing the information we're discussing. You can achieve that in two ways. First would be to watch this episode in our YouTube channel. And this time I'll be dropping this episode uh, in YouTube and podcast format at the same time. So you can go to the YouTube channel under the DX Mentor and check it out. A second way would be to download the slides that we're discussing and then follow along with the podcast. To access the slides, go to ajab.com, click on the DX Mentor podcast menu option, and then click the link AA6YQ slides. Dave did a great job of indicating where we were during the presentation so that you can follow along with the slides if you choose to. However, there are plenty of tips and concepts that can be picked up without using the slides, so I hope you follow along either way. If this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. We have a back catalog of nearly 50 episodes covering many aspects of DX in both podcast and YouTube format. Please check us out. If you are new to DXing, I would really recommend episode one as it was recorded with several world-class DXers. You will get a feel of the excitement that goes with chasing DX. Remember, if you like what you find, please subscribe, like, and share. If you have questions or comments, please email me, email me directly at thedxmentor at gmail.com. I would like to take a minute to share some comments from viewers over the past several episodes. At Stuart M0TTQ Amateur Radio had this to say, fascinating two-parter. I had no idea about the Argentine call areas to pick out one thing from many. He was referring to the Improving Your DX Experience, which was a two-part episode that we aired recently. Our episode on Jarvis Island generated these comments. At me wrong way, he said, hey, awesome guys. And at Stuart, M0TTQ Amateur Radio said, very interesting, thanks. I hope to work them, and I hope you do too. Finally, our episode on POTA versus DX brought quite a few comments. Amongst them were, at ham radios hyphen WD8NVN had this to say, the POTA movement is so well organized. I'm impressed by just how fun sitting in a park with a radio and an antenna can be. And finally, at Bebop Wing One had this to say, I think POTA is one of the best things going on in ham radio right now. It's a great way to get people interested in the hobby and on the air. When I first upgraded to general, there was so much about the hobby to digest, but getting into POTA gave me one specific activity I could focus on. And because it happens every day and uses a structured QSO, it really helped me get over my mic fright. When I talk to folks about ham radio, it's the main thing that I bring up because it's easy for people to understand, and the barrier to entry is much lower than some other activities. You can do it as a technician on 10 meters, and for less than $1,000, you can have a very capable setup that you can take anywhere. And you know, he's right. That's really a great point. So thank you for that and all the other comments. As I mentioned, our guests today are Joe, W-A-G-E-X, and Dave, A-A-6-Y-Q. I worked for Dave many years ago doing ADA, language support, on DOD programs while we both worked for Rational Corporation. Years later, Dave and I crossed paths again at the DX dinner during the Dayton Hamvention. I've been a user of the DX suite since 2006 and have been a huge fan and advocate of it. Without any further delay, let's get started cool for me for several reasons that I'll get into later, um, but I've not uh, found too many things that I feel like are game changers. Certainly um, um, FT8, FT4, and that whole set of digital modes is one thing. And the software that I've been using for better than 10 years now is certainly one of those things. Um, and uh, I, I can't wait to explore that and really talk about what makes it different, but I don't want to give away too much. So of course, tonight, and I'm Bill, AJ, be your host, and with me is uh, Joe. So, Joe, tell us about yourself. Well, I don't know where to start, but I'll start at the, be at the beginning, I guess. Been a ham since uh, 1970. Uh, most of, of the listeners have heard this story before, but for someone new, I took off as a technician, 
and uh, got into DXing on uh, six meters back in the early 70s and been a, a DXer uh, ever since. Been on many, many D expeditions, some big, some small. And uh, here we are doing podcasts now. So Bill, introduce our uh, our guest this evening. Well, I'm, I'm excited for a couple of reasons. Joe and I are starting our, this will be our um, th- 53rd. So our third um, year of podcasting with our special guest tonight. Um, and that's uh, Dave Bernstein. AA6YQ, and a lot of you guys have, have heard of him, I'm sure, for a variety of reasons, and we're going to delve into one that just has me excited. So, uh, Dave, tell us a little about yourself, and how did you get started? Well, good evening, Joe and Bill. Uh, very nice to be here with you guys. I really appreciate it. It's always fun. Uh, Bill and I worked at the same company, Rational Software, so we actually known each other for a long time, and it's really great to, to connect with him and and work on something that neither of us knew we were interested in at the time, <laughs> amateur radio. So I got started um, at age six when my dad bought me a crystal radio kit. And I built that and I set up a long wire antenna. And I was just amazed that this little Galena crystal could somehow enable me to hear distant stations all over the U.S. So that led me to electronics. Um, it didn't lead me to ham radio, interestingly, um, because there were no real hams in our town, and it was a long drive to Philadelphia to get a license. I did some shortwave listening, but it mostly led me to physics and then to particle physics, uh, which eventually led me to MIT, where I got interested in computers and, in particular, designing computers. So I entered professional life as a computer design engineer, uh, did software later. Um, That took me to Silicon Valley in 1981 to help start a company, the company that Bill and I worked together, worked at together. That was Rational Software. And um, my my wife and I brought with us our two young sons. Our youngest son, Brian, was six months when we moved and and John was four. When John got to be around 13, he joined the Boy Scouts and the Boy Scouts had a jamboree on the air. I didn't know what that was, but he needed a ride over to the Foothill College uh, radio club where Terry K7YNO was operating the station. That was the first time in my life, and this is 1990, that I was in an operating amateur radio station. So the boys made QSOs and I watched, uh, Terry supervised. And at the end of it all, Terry said, you know, I'm going to offer a radio merit badge class. Are any of you boys interested? My son, John, raised his hand, as did one of the other kids. And on the spur of the moment, I blurted out, need some help? Well, John and I both ended up with our novice tickets, courtesy of Terry. Uh, got an Icon 735, uh, listened uh, to a couple of QSOs, tried, got into a pileup for a J8 station, and I was hooked on DX from that point forward. So I eventually joined the Northern California DX Club, uh, which requires 100 confirmed contacts to join. Uh, those guys are the ones who really taught me DXing. At the time, packet clusters were just coming into being. They had a uh, they had a, uh, a nice uh, two-meter uh, repeater. Um, it was kind of tag team DXing, which I really enjoyed. Um, and uh, from there, um, you know, the, the notion of writing software to support my DXing habit uh, was pretty straightforward. Um, I pretty much write software for everything. Um, and back then, the, uh, the, the software available to deal with spots coming off uh, packet clusters which at the time were mostly VHF, was pretty primitive. So the first thing I set out to do was to um, be able to capture the spots and do something useful with them, extract information from them. That meant having a way to connect to my radio, so I had to learn about you know connecting to an ICOM 735, and, oh, I need to log contacts, I need to figure out how to do that. So you know for the first 10 years, from 1990 to 2000, the X Lab was just something I used. It was one monolithic application. And, um, you know, people would say, gee, that looks really cool. Can I have it? I couldn't figure out how to install it on somebody else's system, much less make it accessible over the Internet. So that was its uh, ignominious beginnings. Wow. Um, so you, you've you done this on this side of the DX pileup. Have you been DX before? And if so, where? Sort of. Um, you know, Kathy and I went to uh, FJ, St. Bart's. Uh, it was my first uh, Caribbean holiday expedition. Uh, I was uh, AA6YQ slash FJ from there. I uh, have done St. Kitts, have done um, uh, the uh, American Virgin Islands. Uh, the island I've worked the most from is Barbados, where I'm 8P9RY. 
but uh, haven't been traveling uh, since the pandemic. So I think that call sign may have expired. Yeah. Okay. Um, you've you've uh, obtained honor roll, worked all zones, and three thousand plus in the challenge. Kind of give us a feeling for all that. What was the what was difficult? What was easy? And and uh, and what are you still pursuing? So, um, you know, the thing about honor roll is that you never know whether you're going to be able to work them all because they may not all be active. Uh, you know, I got licensed in 1990. I reached um, top of the SSB honor roll in 2008. So 18 years it took me. And part of that, you know, there's good operating, good equipment. I have a good good tower. I have a single tower here in New England uh, with some nice beams on it, but there uh, no monobanders, all multi-band beams. Uh, so I have a good station, but some of it is just being QRV at the right time. Um, you know, when, when stations that didn't used to be accessible like ZA, Albania, uh, and before my time, China, uh, and Scarborough Reef, and, um, you know, North Korea, uh, you know, we worked uh, uh, 404FR, um, P5 slash 404FR, you know, got him on um, SSB and Ritty. Uh, he never worked CW. Wow. So the hard part about DXing is being willing to make the effort and do it, be, and knowing that even if you do everything right, good station, good operating technique, good understanding of propagation, good software, that you're still not guaranteed to be able to get the whole way. And um, there's a, I forget who it was who invented the slogan, DX is. And I think that means, you know, the commitment to the pursuit, even without the guarantee of success. Yeah, I believe that was Marty Lane, if I remember right. Yeah. Um, you, you know, and that is what's thrilling because, you know, how many times have you called CQ or maybe you're calling someone in Europe and you can't get them and all of a sudden you get Indonesia calling you off the back of the beam or something. Yep. It's like, holy smokes, how did that happen? So I'll never forget ZD7MY coming back to my um, CQ when I lived in California. Um, and, you know, it's just, it was like this tropical island, this woman's voice. It was incredible. It's just a memorable QSO. And it probably was my first QSO was ZD7, but still, you know, that's not a particularly rare entity, but you still remember those things all your life. Right, right, right. Um, why do I equate your call sign uh, with Logbook of the World? So um, Logbook of the World was launched in uh, 2000 as a project by the league. It took them till 2003 to get it out the door. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't really put enough resources on it. So it went out with no testing and no documentation. Um, and instead of addressing those shortfalls, they added more functionality. They added WPX support um, and uh, I think WAS support. And as a result, um, come around November 2012, uh, after only being available 90% of the time, it crashed a lot, it crashed and wouldn't restart. And given this track record, I was just petrified that Logbook was going to get canceled. And it's, you know, yeah, it was unreliable. It had its problems, but boy, it saved a lot of money for DXers. I mean, if you think about how much time and money we spend on on paper and filling out QSL cards and trying to find QSL routes and you know having them not work after six months and you know the postage costs, um, LOTW saves all of that. Um, not, not to mention the the more rapid turnaround time. Right. So I really wanted to make sure that logbook would survive. So. Um, I called up Dave K, uh, K1ZZ, who was CEO of the league at the time, drove down there, had lunch with he and Mike K1MK, and basically convinced them to let me help. So my help was not in the form of programming. That wasn't their issue particularly. The problem was he just didn't have enough full-time resources. So we got a bunch of hands together with strong database experience, uh, Ken K1EA, Dave KM3T, um, Michael G7VJR, the guy who does club log. Uh, Rich K1KMU, and we did an architecture review, and we reviewed the overall state of logbook, and then we basically put together a roadmap. This is the order in which things should be addressed and corrected. And guess what? We need two full-time developers to do that. So Greg K0GW, who was appointed the uh, head of the logbook committee, went to the board with this information, convinced them to authorize the hiring of two developers, uh, which Mike K1MK, he was the uh, CIO at the time. So Mike did that. I helped re uh, recruit a little bit. Um, we also took on rebooting TQSL. Uh, Rick K1MU uh, was the lead on that. And basically set about addressing the reliability problems first, 
and the performance problem second. Um, and that was done by the LOTW team at the ARRL. Um, I acted more like a project manager, a coach. Um, I also wrote the documentation that never got written so, uh, so that people can at least find their way through the maze. So um, we were going great guns. We got all the way to 2016, 2017. Uh, we negotiated with CQ and got WAS support implemented. Um, we were thinking about how to improve the user interface next. Uh, Michael G G7VJR from Clublog came to the league, talked about how we might do that together. But unfortunately, league management decided to put their resources elsewhere. So those two developers that were working full time went off to work on other projects. And Logbook really hasn't changed much since. So the good news is it's been reliable. Uh, it's been performant. There have been a couple episodes where something went wrong and took a while to fix it. But, you know, the last time we measured availability, it was 99.99%. Uh, and, you know, after a, a weekend contest, it typically recovers in a day or two. So um, I just hope that we someday can put resources back on it so we can improve its user interface uh, because a lot of people just won't use it because they find it too difficult to use. You, you know, you sit back and you look at all the people involved and the 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 experience and the uh, software power and everything else that put that together. That would have that would have been quite an expensive endeavor for the league if if they didn't have all you volunteers jumping in to help out. So. Well, you know, it, it's a good group of people. Uh, I enjoyed working with them. I learned a bunch while we did it. Um, and, you know, Rick K1MU continues to push um, TQSL forward. That was another, you know, very uh, erratic, uh, unreliable application. And he basically combined two applications into one, made it reliable, made it easy to use, and continues to move it forward. That's an open source project. So, yeah, I mean, you know, the league has lots of really good volunteers. And and we all benefit from their efforts. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when we when I think about software, um, you know, automatically with you and DX Suite, I, I think about what that is. I mean, you know, how it works together. But maybe for all of our listeners, what is DX Suite and how did it come about? So you kind of touched on that, but I, I touched on it a little bit. I wrote I wrote this big thing for myself that had rig control and logging and. It, it collected data from spots and let me analyze it. And we'll talk about exactly what that analysis is. That's really the focal point for this talk um, because it's really about finding and working the DX you need. Um, so I had done all that, but I, I did it exclusively for myself. And I wasn't even thinking about how, how to let anybody else use it. I was also working full time at Rational at the time. So uh, there were some limits on how much time I had available. But um, there came a point where I think it was Tony uh, N2SS posted on some reflector that he had trouble getting his his uh, uh, ICOM transceiver to interface correctly with his ICOM PW1 amplifier, and he couldn't figure out why. So I was able to basically extract the rig control functionality from DX Lab into a thing that monitored the ICOM CIB bus so we could see exactly what was going on, sent it to him. And he basically uh, discovered that he had a blown fuse, um, a, blown fuse. Yeah. a blown fuse, which he fixed. And that was the end of that. And then um, Peter G3PLX um, invented a sound card implementation of PSK31 digital mode. And um, I thought that was really cool. Uh, it's faster than Ritty with error correction. I thought, what a great mode for DXing. Um, but I thought, you know, do I really want to add this to this big conglomeration I've already got? Maybe I should make it a standalone program. So now I had a standalone transceiver control application. Then I had a standalone um, uh, digital mode application doing PSK31 and RIDI. And then I thought, well, you know, if I was ever going to let anybody else use this, maybe I should make all of the functionality be standalone and have them automatically detect each other's presence and interoperate. So... You know, one application for logging, one application for transceiver control, one application to manage an antenna and point it in the right direction, assuming you have one of those. Um, so it would basically be a suite of applications rather than one big monolithic application. And the secondary advantage of that would be that they would be loosely coupled and I could work on them in parallel. And that really, that transition occurred around 2000, 2001. Um, in fact, I was coding on the plane as I was flying to St. Bart's in 2001 so that I could use it at St. Bart's. And I actually logged all the St. Bart's QSOs um, using uh, what is now DX Keeper. 
and um, had a lot of help. I mean, a lot of people who had, were distributing software on the internet coached me on how best to do that. Uh, some people coached me on how to set up a discussion group among users of the software so I could get rapid feedback. And when people had problems, we could report it rapidly. And so that's really what launched the DX Lab Suite in 2001. Wow. Yeah, I, I will say this. Um, as I've talked to people that have tried it, they'll say, oh, that's far too complicated or it's far too involved. And and I think the problem is they look at all six or seven modules at once as, as opposed to just saying, let's just use DX Keeper and let's put our cues in there and then go from there. So um, anybody that's listening that has shied away from it, uh, other than the fact it's free, I mean, it's a terrific suite of tools and uh, um, it it becomes easy to use. It just, there's there's a slight learning curve. I don't want to mislead anybody and say it's, it's as easy as other things, but it's not overwhelming by any any sense. So, well, the focus is on power. Um, you know, this is all about recognizing that uh, Moore's law drove us from you know tiny little microprocessors that could hardly do anything to machines that are a thousand times more powerful than what we had when we when I started DX Lab just twenty years ago. So. Um, you know, Moore's law was a big driver. The cost of RAM has fallen through the floor. You know, we have machines now with 16 gigabytes and we think that maybe we need 32. Um, you know, we have screens with thousands of pixels in both directions and most people have two or three of them, or at least a lot of people do. So all of the basic hardware componentry has just become incredibly uh, accessible to pretty much any ham. And so one way to think about the X lab is it translates all those improvements in hardware technologies into improvements in DXing. Um, I certainly rode that curve when I learned, you know, when, when I was using DX lab to, you know, crawl up the honor roll and DXCC challenge. So, you know, with respect to learning curve, there is a learning curve. And one of the reasons is that some of what DX lab provides still remains unique. I'm a little surprised that that's the case. But to my knowledge, there is no other application that takes incoming spots and puts them in a database with one entry for each active station and then provides you with a whole bunch of tools to exploit the data that's in that database. And we'll talk about exactly how DX Lab does that. So that's novel. Um, a lot of people come to DX Lab from some other logging application, which they know very well because they've been using it for 10 years and you know their spinal cord knows how to operate it. They don't have to think about the keystrokes. It's just built in. So, you know, it's natural to come to the X lab and say, oh, I, I want that same familiarity with this new application that has different keystrokes and different mouse gestures uh, and has some novel functionality that you may have never seen before. Uh, the advantage of being able to go one application at a time greatly reduces the impact of that learning curve if <laughs> you go one application at a time. Right. If, however, you jump in and say, I want to do all of this in this weekend, you know, that's the path to frustration. And yeah. a lot of people don't survive that that particular path. Do you have an idea of how many users there might be on it right now? So there's a DX Lab discussion group, and that group has around 6,000 users. These are people who are very active DX Lab users. I would call them, you know, absolute advocates. They're, you know, they, um, they, they really love the application. They're active in reporting defects. They're active in suggesting enhancements. They're active in testing out new versions before they're public rele publicly released. Um, so there's at least 6,000 users. Um, but wherever I go, I run into people who are DX Lab users that are not members of that group. Um, you know, they heard about it from someplace else, or they just found the web page and downloaded it. Um, the usual figure of thumb in the software industry is that the number of active users is 10 times the number of aficionados. So if there's 6,000 aficionados, maybe there's 50,000 users worldwide. A lot of people don't use the whole suite. They might just use Commander for transceiver control, or they might just use DX view for rotating their antenna, or they might just use Prop view to get graphical propagation forecasts out of the VOA cap engine. So it's not like everybody uses the whole suite. Lots of people just use one or two components. Right. Mm -hmm. So what what is the support model like? You said there's a group. Um and I, I have to tell you, I think I've only put in a couple of of um, work orders, so to speak, you know, requests, and I get instant, I mean, instant within an hour or two. Have you tried this? Did you look at this? This is known. Here's what you're doing wrong. I've been really shocked at the response. Yeah, um, it's very good. And the reason is that 
our group is extraordinarily friendly. That's the principle of the group. Um, all questions are welcome, no matter how many times they may have been asked and answered before or how obvious the answers might be in the documentation. So nobody ever gets slapped down for asking the wrong question. And the one or two times in the last 21 years where something like that happened, that person was put on moderated status and coached and and before they returned to the fold. So it's it's a fun place to be. And as a result, people are willing to share their frustration, run in, I ran into this problem, I don't know how to make this work. And the goal is always response within 24 hours. We usually beat that. Yeah. Um, with respect to defects, my explicit objective is uh, all defects are all reported defects are repaired within 24 hours of being reported. All, mm. not just data loss, not just extreme. You know, if there's a misspelled word on, on a uh, in a in a panel, that gets fixed within 24 hours. And as I sit here today, across the entire suite, the number of reported but uncorrected defects in DX Lab is zero, and wow. it's generally between zero and two, depending upon how long it takes me to get to sure. something. I have a lot of help. Joe W4TV, for example, uh, has developed many of the databases, the DXCC database. Um, he's, there's a, a nice thing in DX Lab where if you click anywhere on the world map, it will tell you what country you clicked on or what countries you may have clicked on. That's because Joe's grid square to DXCC database lets DX Lab do that. Um, there are several other users who are very, very good at finding quarter cases, um, finding defects, suggesting enhancements. I call it user-driven development because the way it works is that people make suggestions and then we don't, I don't just implement them, we bat them around. Sometimes it's inappropriate. Sometimes you get suggestions that are just way too specific to one particular user's style. Um, Another problem is that you know people want, give me an option to do X. Well, every time you add an option, you got to document it. It makes the perceived complexity of the application greater. So when you think about adding a new optional capability, you have to balance that against what's that do to the learning curve? What's that do to the perceived complexity? So we chew it around and many times, things that starting out in the conversation, I thought, well, that's not that's not a really good idea, but it morphs over the, the discussion and the brainstorming into something really great. And if I can implement that in a day or three or four, it just doesn't get more fun than that, to yeah. be able to take a suggestion that was created by brainstorming with a bunch of users, inter all interested in DXing, and be able to turn that into something that everybody can use and everybody can enjoy. And that's been going on for 20 plus years. You know, there's a great feeling, isn't it? It's a wonderful feeling. Yes. There, there's a great feature that got me in trouble. And that <laughs> is, you have a grid that pops up with, um, off the top of my head, I'm thinking like 20 common phrases, right, that you, my name is or my transmitter is. And whoever you happen to be working, it will put it in the appropriate language for that <laughs> country, right? So I was working at JA and made the mistake of saying, here's who I am, here's what your signal is. And here's where I'm located. Well, he now assumes I'm fluent in Japanese. And <laughs> <laughs> he just comes back with this. Bur -bur -bur -bur. It's like, oh, OK, I see what I did here. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. It, it doesn't often get mentioned. That's the universal translator. It's right out of Star Trek. So because, <laughs> because there's a part of DX Lab that can analyze any call sign and tell you what DXCC entity it is, it was easy to build what's called the translation database, and Bill W9OL originally started and populated that. I haven't heard from Bill for a long time. He may well be silent. Key, great guy, but Bill uh, helped me flesh that out and, and fill it with translation. So there's a bunch of built-in phrases, and I think it does it for I forget how many how many different DXCC entities. But you know, you can say hello or goodbye. The actual moment, the, the inspiration for it came from Bob W9KNI's, the, the, um, the, what is it, the perfect DXer? Uh, uh, the complete DXer. Complete DXer, yep. where he makes the suggestion that to break a pileup, that you you say please in the DX station's language. Uh -huh. So you say please in Japanese, or please in Syrian, or please, and I, I like to say shakran when I'm working someone in one of the Arab countries. You know, it just makes a big difference to be able to, and I do it in CW, you know, I'll, I'll say, you know, thanks in CW at the end of a, a contact with somebody in Hungary or somebody in Yugoslavia, I guess, or Serbia. Um, it, it just makes for a more special QSO. 
and people remember you for doing it. And it's pretty good at breaking through pileups too. Yeah, it's effective. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of excellent logging programs, right? I mean, and there are some really solid ones. Um, what do you think uh, differentiates DX Suite? So DX Suite is a lot more than just a logging program. I mean, you know, most applications can log and they can uh, control your transceiver and they can um, rotate your antenna. That's, the, you know, that's uh, table stakes for, for DXing software these days. And, you know, I work with a lot of those guys. I've been a part of the ADIF developer community for a long time. Um, and we all work together. And, you know, Bob K4CY, who develops Logger32, you know, we get, we get along pretty well. We occasionally send each other requests for help. And, you know, the M1MM guys, uh, Tom is really great. You know, he he helped me with some spectrum analyzer stuff. I help him with some other stuff. So, you know, we're not as competitive as people might think. Now, given that most of us are offering free applications, you know, that makes it easy to work that way. But even the guys who are doing uh, commercial applications, you know, the relations among people are pretty good. What makes DX Lab different, I think, is the spot database, the active DX database. The fact that each incoming spot is added to the database, and we'll be going through this in some detail, and we can use the information in the database to, to identify the operating patterns of DX stations that we need, and we can also deduce actual propagation. It's great to be able to use VOA cap, you know, to be able to, and, and uh, PropView does that, to be able to forecast propagation. But forecast propagation is just a best guess based on an ionospheric model and the current solar parameters, the solar flux and the K index and the A index. Being able to actually identify openings between your QTH and the QTH of a station you're trying to work, that is really what makes the old saw, listen, 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 worthwhile. But to listen, 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 you have to know where to listen and when to listen, what bands, what modes, what time. And the spot, the active DX database, I call it the spot database, is what enables you to do that. Because all that data goes into this database that you can query, and we'll see that it shows you exactly when and where you should spend your time listening. And that's what makes it possible, certainly made it possible for me, to get from a novice ticket to the top of the honor roll in sideband uh, in 18 years. And I only need P5 for CW, and I only need three others, uh, one of which I think is Bouvet for Riddy. So, you know, um, it really does help. And there, there are a lot of other DX Lab users who've had the same experience. They have different objectives. They may be not going for honor roll. They may be going for top of WAS or five band DXCC or you know a lot of different objectives. But um, it really does help. So we, we've gotten a lot of the in, introductory stuff out of the way. Can we jump in and take a look at that? We certainly can. So um, I know that you distributed this presentation ahead of time. So um, what I'm going to do as I go through it um, is um basically state the slide number I'm on so I'm hoping that all of your listeners have access to the presentation or if they don't they can go download it now and I'll state the slide number and um uh, Bill and Joe will butt in if I forget to do that um okay. so that you guys can all keep up with me okay and, um we'll go from there and you know my um my Call sign is my email address. It's aa6yq at ambersoft.com. That's alpha alpha six Yankee Quebec at and ambersoft is alpha um, alpha Mary Baker Echo Romeo Sierra Oscar Frank Tango ambersoft.com. Um, so if you have questions or you want to learn more, don't hesitate to um, to send me email or um, log on to the DX Lab uh, 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 discussion group. You just Google it and you'll find it. It's on uh, uh, on the web. And I'll okay. have all that in the show notes too. So Great. Okay, so here we go. So um, the motto of DX Lab is better DXing with software. And I think I alluded to that in the introduction. All this great hardware technology over the last 20 years, we can reap the benefits of that by becoming better DXers. So be nice if my, there we go. So what is DXing? I think everybody knows this, the art and science of making two-way contacts with distant amateur radio stations using phone, CW, or digital modes. And I promise that's the last slide I will read. Um, <laughs> slide, slide three. Um, so there's really two fundamental benefits of DX Lab. The first being that it just eliminates a lot of paperwork. 
you know, getting QSL confirmations, getting QSL cards, uh, submitting applications for awards, uh, all that stuff, that really takes a lot of time. And so DX Lab automates a lot of that. We're not going to talk about any of that today. We're going to talk about the second objective, which is to make you more productive by finding the DX you need and working the DX you need. So to do that, I'm now on slide five. I'm going to give you an introduction to the DX Lab suite. Basically, what drove its development um, from a software point of view, what its architecture is, and this whole concept of multiple views of active DX. So we'll spend some time basically understanding DX Lab and its structure and what it provides. And then we'll follow up by explaining how to go about finding the DX you need and then working the DX you need. So moving to slide six, here are the drivers. So I think I mentioned this, I call it user-driven iterative development. So we have an online group with about 6,000 participants. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, defect repairs get the highest priority in answering questions. All the enhancement lists are public and people make frequent requests for enhancements and we debate them and brainstorm them. Because the suite is multiple applications, uh, we'll get, I'm a little ahead of myself, but there are eight of them, I can work on them in parallel, which means in any given time, I can be at, fixing a bug in one of them while I'm adding an enhancement to a second one, while I'm handing, implementing an even bigger enhancement to a third one. So releases are pretty frequent, like several per month. The goal is to have DX Lab be both powerful and easy to use. Now, there's a conflict there because the more power you put into something, the more people have to learn. And we talked about the learning curve issue, um, but the goal is to have both. Um, it's primarily for DXers, hence the name, but a lot of casual operators use it. Um, maybe they use it for transceiver control or for logging. Um, so the, the user community spans a pretty broad range of high-end DXers all the way to you know, first-time users who are using this as their first logging application. It runs on all the various uh, variants of Windows from NT forward. Of course, these days, most people are using 7, 8, 10, or 11. Uh, you can run it on Mac and a Linux in a virtual machine. Some users insist on doing that, uh, but it's a native Windows application. Okay, slide seven. So the DX Lab suite is basically eight applications. They're free. You can run them individually. If you run more than one, they detect each other's presence automatically, and they interoperate automatically. So that's the high-level design here. So you can start wherever you want. Doesn't matter whether you start with transceiver control or logging or controlling your rotator or looking up QSL routes. Any path through the maze is yours. These are the seven functional applications. I'm on slide eight. Starting in the lower left corner, Prop View provides propagation, forecasting, and beacon monitor. DX Keeper provides logging. Commander co provides transceiver control, and it pretty much will control any transceiver that has a CAT interface, a, a programmatic interface uh, to a computer. I think there's more than 150 models um, that, uh, that, com of, that Commander now supports. That's a long way from the ICOM 735 that I started with. Huh. Win Warbler talks to sound card to do RIDI and PSK. Uh, it includes the MMTTY engine, um, and it also has the ability to do CW generation, does not do CW decoding, but there are other applications that it interoperates with that do that if you really want that. DXView does location control. So DXView is fundamentally the thing that can take a call sign and analyze it and tell you what DXCC entity it is, and if it's in China, what district in China it is, or what district it is in the Soviet Union in Russia. Um, or, you know, unfortunately, we can't figure out what county it is in the United States, um, but we do have a database that lets us know uh, which state you're in. Um, spot Collector, I started talking about already, this ingests DX spots and, and maintains a database that we can exploit. We'll be spending a lot of time on that. And Pathfinder, which is a web-based application that you can enter a call sign and search many different locations to figure out uh, how to get a QSL. So as I think I already mentioned, this architecture is modular uh, in that these applications basically take care of all business. There's no rig control in any application except Commander. So when I need to add support for a new radio, Commander is the only application I have to touch. 
All the other applications, when they want a transceiver to QSY to a particular frequency in a particular mode, they send a message over that red bus to Commander, and Commander does it for them. Um, and if they need to track the frequency, like the XCuper needs to be able to log the frequency and mode in, in the QSO you're logging, it gets that from Commander. And the same is true of logging and spotting and all the rest of it. It's all self-contained. Uh, this is, there's a fundamental principle in software engineering, modern software engineering, that this is about, which is called information abstraction or information hiding. Uh, and the basic benefit of it is it allows you to work on things simultaneously because they're all very distinct and very separate. And the coupling between them is loose. Sorry for the lecture in computer science. Um, okay, moving on to slide nine, that central bus is well-documented. And as a result of that, lots of other applications are able to interoperate with the XLAB applications via that same bus. So for example, if you're using FL Digi and you want to use Commander for transceiver control, you can do so. If you're using um, uh, multi-PSK, you can do that, CW Skimmer. Uh, WSJTX has the option of using Commander for transceiver control. Uh, you know, JT Alert can log QSOs to DX Keeper, so can several other applications. So this basic architecture expanded nicely to let me basically collaborate with my fellow uh, software developers so I didn't have to develop everything. And so my, I have this uh, practice, which is if somebody's already implemented something and it works well, then I'll interoperate with it, make DXLab interoperate with it, not try and reinvent the wheel. So there's no need to do CW decoding because MRP40 and CW Skimmer do very nice jobs of that. So why waste time reinventing that wheel when it already can be made to interoperate with DXLab? A bit of philosophy there. And you can see there's some other applications that talk directly. So DXView can talk directly to Google Earth and display you know, spots and, and uh, log QSOs on Google Earth. And um, some other, you know, Trek Commander can talk to various um, satellite control engines like SATPC32 and, and SAT. Okay, so when it's on screen, this is what it might look like. So here you see basically the screen of all seven of the major applications. Um, I won't go through them individually, but you can get an idea of what they look like. The one downside of this approach, the multiple independent applications as opposed to one giant humongous application, is control. So, you know, how do you upgrade these? How do you get them started? You know, do you have to start up seven applications one at a time? Well, there's an eighth application called the launcher. I'm now on slide 11. The launcher handles installation, upgrade, startup, and shutdown. So you can define a subset of the suite, the ones you use, and with one click of the start button, that subset comes up. And with one click of the terminate button, that subset terminates. If you click the minimize button, they all minimize all their windows. When a new version is available, the lights, the, the, you get a, 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 an indication, as you see in this window, uh, in the middle of slide 11 at the bottom of the launcher, it says new app upgrades. If you then click the configuration window, you can upgrade any new apps with one click per, per application. So it's very simple, very straightforward. So we eliminated the one deficit of this multi-application architecture. Okay, so moving on to slide 12, we've now completed a breathless review of the architecture and the drivers. And we'll now talk about my favorite topic, multiple views of active DX. Um, this is a thing, as I said, of all the things DX Lab does, and it does uh, several novel things. This is by far the most novel and, and unique. So let's talk, take a look at slide 13. This is the active DX database. And here I'm showing you two entries in this database, one for P5DX and one for KP1RY, um, two uh, DX stations we'd all love to work. Um, so this database has one entry for each active station in a particular mode near a particular frequency. The database is populated from these sources that you see here, Telnet clusters, Reverse Beacon Network, DX Summit, WSJTX. So between Telnet clusters and Reverse Beacon Network, you can have up to four sources, plus DX Summit, plus WSJTX. So uh, first question somebody might ask is, why, why do you need multiple sources? Well, WSJTX is unique because it's your station, decoding station. So that's extremely useful information. Uh, DX Summit and the other Telnet clusters 
The redundancy is important for two reasons. One, spot sources sometimes go down. So if you're just connected to one cluster and you're trying to collect information so you can learn about the operating pattern of a particular station, and either there's a network connectivity problem or the station has a problem or there's a power failure and you lose that source, your database doesn't get populated. So being able to connect to multiple sources is very helpful, uh, just from a pure redundancy point of view. There's a second observation, and that is, even in this day and age, I have found that DX clusters nearest the DX propagate the spot faster than ones that are further away. And the delay time might be as much as 30 seconds. Now you say, okay, 30 seconds, what's the big deal? Well, you know, if you're in the mode where you're new and you have a lot of DX to work and everything is needed, or maybe you're pursuing the DX marathon and it's January or February, and you know you want to get that station in, in uh, ZA quick, um, 30 seconds can be the difference between getting a QSO and having to wait in a pileup for half an hour or an hour. So having DX cluster sources spread around the world as opposed to all in one place reduces the latency on when you get notified that something you might need is active. That's why the multiple spot sources. Okay, so let's now focus on the database itself. So I said it's one entry for each station in a particular mode near a frequency. So let's look at the entry for P5DX. He's on 14005. Spot collector monitors the spot notes and inspects each spot note that comes in. And if it sees a QSX indication, it says, oh, this guy's working split, and that's the last reported split. So the database always knows the last reported split frequency for a station working split. The first, the, 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 the mode column tells us he's in CW. The first column says he was first spotted near 14005 in CW around 117 Zulu but he continues to have been spotted until 341 Zulu. And if we look at the next seven columns, we can see that he's been spotted from Europe, he's been spotted from the west coast of North America, and he's been spotted from Oceania. So that tells us something about who's hearing this guy. And we'll delve into this a lot more, but you know, those of us on the East Coast, you know, there's no evidence that any of us are hearing this guy. He's not been spotted from the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Take a look at the next entry, KP1RY, 28080 in RIDI, also operating split. And this guy has been heard from all over the place. He's been heard from Europe and Africa, South America, the East Coast and, and Midwest of North America. So, you know, if I just see this right away, I'm going to know, boy, if I want to work KP1RY, I have a really good shot at this, get busy. But this is the fundamental database that we're talking about when we talk about the active DX database. And, and I think the, the point that I want to make sure that is driven home is there might be 40 spots for that P5DX. So instead of coming in and looking at this whole grid where there's all these 40 spots and you got to go through, this is just an aggregate of all the spots that were CW around that frequency uh, starting and ending in those times. And, and I have found that to be a huge filter that's just built in for me already. And that was exactly the motivation that led me to build this. When I first started looking at packet spots, which were what, a hundred times slower than what we have today, is you yeah, inundated yeah. with this screen full of, of call signs and you couldn't find anything. They were duplicates, the same station multiple times. This, re this dramatically reduces the, the clutter that a DXer has to see in order to get the information he or she needs. Okay. So now I'm on slide 14, multiple views of active DX. So there's our active DX database in the upper uh, left corner. And it answers the question, which DX stations are currently active? Which are currently QRV? Now, because we only create a new spot database entry when a station is spotted for the very first time on a particular, uh, in a particular mode near a particular frequency, we can actually, if we want to, generate a propagation forecast on the spot. So we're not saying generate a propagation forecast every time a station's spotted, just the first time they're spotted on the current frequency and mode. And we use the BOA cap engine to do that. So that answers the question, which active DX stations can I likely copy? Hmm. So right there is uh, some, some vital information. Uh, you know, uh, We all know not to chase 160 meter DX in the middle of the day, 
<laughs> but you know, chasing some 20 meter DX in some occasions is an equal waste of time because there's just no propagation opening and VOA cap will show you that. So now on slide 16, we're looking at the log database, which includes the usual list of all log QSOs, the blue on the right. But above and beyond that, in order to be able to accurately point your attention to active DX stations that you need, we got to be able to determine whether you need a station instantaneously. We can't take the time to look through your 10,000 log QSOs or your 45,000 log QSOs. And I know guys with 252,000 log QSOs. I mean, those, those kinds of searches take minutes, if not longer. We have to be able to instantaneously know that when ZC4RI just popped up on 40 meter CW, whether or not you need to work that. So inside your log database is a set of eight tables, one for each of the awards for which DX Lab provides real time award tracking. So let's just take DXCC. There's a DXCC need tables that knows given what you're pursuing, and we'll see that in a minute, you know, the bands and modes you're pursuing DXCC on, it knows exactly where you stand on each of the 340 current DXCC entities. And so when one of them pops up uh, from a spot source, we can instantly know whether or not to highlight, announce, whatever that, and draw your attention to it. The same is done with IOTA, the same is done with Marathon, the same is done with VUCC, WAS, WIPEX, and WAS. Leaderboard is a funny thing. That's something that the club long guys did where, you know, People compete to be able to work all of the expedition, like right now today, CY, CY9C is on. Um, and people want to work CY9C on all 10 bands and all three modes and all combinations thereof. So that's 30, 30 QSOs. That's called leaderboard. And some people like to compete for that. And as a result, DX Lab so provides support for that. So you can add CY9C to your list of special call signs with a leaderboard tag, and you'll get prompted to be able to work CY9C on all, all 30 combinations of 10 bands and three modes. Okay, so those tables tell us what QSOs and confirmations are needed for the awards that we're pursuing on the bands and modes specified. On to slide 17. This is how you indicate what bands and modes are specified. So uh, starting on the left, you see the DXCC bands and modes panels got three uh, sets of, of options highlighted in red. So on the left are the bands I pursue, 160 through six. Um, these are the DXCC bands I pursue. It's not my fault that, the DX, that uh, 60 meters isn't in this box, but uh, the ARL doesn't consider 60 meters big enough for DXCC. I happen to agree with them, um, but it's not my fault. Um, so uh, I'm pursuing phone, CW, and digital. And the box below requires a little bit of information. I think I mentioned early on that I was really taken with uh, Peter G3PLX's invention of PSK31, or at least the sound card implementation. And I really wanted to encourage people to use it for DXing. So even though there's no PSK31 variant of DXCC, I added a PSK31 variant of DXCC. So uh, for a while, a long while, there was a PSK31 checkbox underneath that digital checkbox. And if you check that box, then DX Lab would help you work every all 340 DXCC entities in PSK31. And I did that for a while. Well, you know, lots of people like PSK31, but guess what? When FT8 showed up, a lot more people wanted to work all the DXCC entities in FT8 or FT4. So what I did is I replaced that checkbox with a selector, and now you can select any digital mode you want and say, over and above phone, CW, and digital, I want to work all 340 DXCC entities in JT65. Um, so that's a capability. And since... Um, I've kind of topped out where I am with honor roll and DXCC challenge new ones are few and far between. My current main DXing uh, objective is to, to work all 340 uh, DXCC entities in FT8. When I get the confirmation for N5J, that'll be number 300. So I'm having fun with that. So um, you can also see um, for the bottom, the middle, uh, I'm pursuing VUCC on six meters. To the right, I'm pursuing WAS on 160 and 6. Um, and over in the far right in the bottom, I'm pursuing five-band work doll zones. Um, so those are my DXing objectives. 
but you can see I'm not pursuing Whippix. A lot of people love that award. I have pursued Marathon several years and enjoy that very much. You can specify the bands and modes you're pursuing Marathon. You can actually pursue multiple Marathon categories simultaneously and then submit the one that has the highest score or the one that you like best. The IOTA you can pursue. Um, so those are the major awards that, that um, are, are supported for real-time award tracking. Now, there's like 30 or 40 different awards for which DX Lab can generate progress reports. But we're talking about being prompted when DX you need is active. So, so Dave, is there a um, an alarm that will go off or a voice comes on and say that your WAS on six meters is is available? Yes, there is, and we'll okay. do, we'll see that in a minute. But um, so, you have the option of enabling an audio announcement. And we have recorded voices, courtesy of Joe DX, um, who um, basically announces uh, a station. It can, he can announce it phonetically, if you like, and the band and the mode and why it's needed. So he might say, work to all states, or he might say DXCC, so that you know, you know what, what's needed. Sure. Um, okay. Thank you. Slide 18. So now two new, two new databases have appeared in the architecture diagram. Uh, an LOTW database and an EQSLAG database. So logbook of world confirmations are good for all ARRL awards. They're also good for WAS and um, uh, worked, WPX worked all prefix. EQSLAG confirmations, that's authenticity guaranteed, are only good for CQ awards uh, like uh, WAS and WPX and worked all counties and stuff like that. So every two weeks, uh, I download information from each of those award sponsors. It's so basically a list of each of their participants and the date at which each of their participants last submitted a QSO. And so those two databases uh, are very useful because when you look at active DX and DX that you need, knowing that it confirms via logbook of the world makes it more exciting. You know, if there are multiple opportunities to work DX, and some of them QSL by logbook, and some of them don't, and you're pursuing DXCC, you know where to focus your attention. Um, th there's some fine points that you can use by exploiting the date information, but I'm not going to go into that now or here, but uh, it is quite, quite useful. Okay, so let's move on to slide 19. So now what's appeared is in the middle, a big blue box that says view generator. So we have all these databases. We have the, the active DX database. We have the logbook and EQSL databases. We have the log database and all those tables in there. And what the view generator does is it shows us the information in those databases in useful ways. So the first useful way is the way we're all used to looking at things, which is in a table, the tabular form. So let's move to slide 20 and take a look at that. Okay. So here, what you're seeing in the middle is entries in the active DX database, the spot database. So let's go through it column by column. The leftmost column says need. Do I need this? And if so, why? And you can see that there's one column in there, excuse me, one row in there, the one for 3Y0RY, that's Bouvet, um, that is has a red D in it. In fact, the whole row is red, and it's red because I need it for DXCC. Um, I have not worked Bouvet uh, on ready. And so the D means DXCC. You know, there are other letters that have means for other awards, you know, for WAS, for WAS, uh, S's, for worked all states. Um, and so you can very quickly understand that, hey, there's something active right now that I need. Now, you know, I'll, I'll clue you in that I, I injected that spot so I could make this screenshot. Um, you know, I have to be careful when I do this at radio clubs because people run off to try and work 3Y0 or Y because they need it too, because um, they think it's active and it's not. Um, so going through this column by column, um, that's the need column. Call sign obvious. Call column is obvious. That's the call sign. The prefix um, tells you what DXCC entity it is. And if you let your mouse cursor hover over HA, it will tell you that that's hungry. Uh, so if you forget what some of the prefixes are, uh, there's built in uh, a reminder. The band, again, obvious, the mode, obvious. So here we see the first time and last time columns. So the first time column says, 
when was this station first spotted on this band in this mode? Uh, TA7I, the first entry, first spotted at 1919 Zulu on the 16th. When the last time column, when was he most recently spotted? Same one. So here's an example, TA7I is a station who was spotted exactly once. Uh, if we move over a little bit, we can see he's on 14027.4. The QSX column is empty, meaning that he's not operating split. Uh, we don't know anything about primary uh, administrative subdivisions. That's what PRI stands for. Uh, we don't know anything about primary subdivisions in, in Turkey. Can't, can't figure that out from his call sign, so that's empty. But we do know that he's in CQ Zone 20. Uh, Turkey is not IOTA, uh, not an island. But we know his grid square is KM69. And we know the next column, ODX, that the station who spotted TA7, TA7I, the closest station who spotted him was 3,830 miles from my QTH. And that's consistent with the fact that if you look at the next seven columns, E, the only place he's been spotted from is Europe. That the Y in the EU means spotted from Europe. Um, continuing over to the right, past the um, the uh, geography columns, you see three columns, or actually four columns, having to do with propagation. So I think I showed you in the earlier diagram that we can optionally do propagation forecasts for all of these. So the SPSNR column is the short path signal to noise ratio. So VOA cap is saying the short path signal to noise ratio is 29, but more importantly for us, that means that the probability, the SPP, the probability of an opening on short path is 82%. And uh, that says, you know, you want if we need Turkey, you want to work Turkey, you have a very good shot at being able to make a QSO with 82%. So LP is long path, so you see the same SNR and probability entries for those. Don't don't ignore the long path. Long, as a long path is the de extra spread. I've made more than a few uh, needed QSOs because there was a propagation opening on the long path that nobody knew about because everybody focuses on short path propagation openings. Mm -hmm. So always look for the uh, long path uh, openings as well as short path path openings. Okay, so um, let's scroll down here a little bit mentally to the uh, row for eight Q seven VB. It's the third row from the bottom. So this follows in 8Q, um, Maldives. So this is, he's active on 30 meter CW. Note that he was spotted for the first time at 17.7, excuse me, 17.17, and he's still active more than two hours later. He's on 14.107 and he's evidently operating split. And the last time that he uh, made a QSO split, his transmit frequency was, I'm sorry, his listening frequency was 10.108. So right away, you want to work 8Q, you know, this is giving you a leg up on how to break the pileup. CQ zone 22, his IOTA is AS013, there's his grid square. But again, the closest spotting station to me for this guy, 3,400, almost 3,500 miles away. He's been spotted from Europe. He's been spotted from Oceania. So, and if you look at the next column, the signal to noise ratio is minus five, and the probability of an opening is one. So... You know, even though this might be a juicy target, at least for me, on the short path, I'm not going to get anywhere. And spending my time trying to make that QSO would be a waste of time that I could spend more productively elsewhere. You know, I can remember, the, go ahead. I can remember the, the first time I set this up, I used to be uh, in the late 70s. I was a nut trying to find work oblasts. There were like four of us in Cincinnati, and we were always pushing each other to work all these Russian oblasts. But the problem was there was no, you know, RU4A and RU4B might be in two different locations. So you had all these charts and all, and, and you know, the, the problem was I'd hear a call and you get to a point where you say, well, I'll work him just to work him. But sure enough, the guy right next to you just worked an oblast you needed. it. And, and I remember installing this at the time and thinking, my God, if I'd have had this with the ability to show me these subdivisions or these oblasts that these Russians were working, what a difference that would have made. It's particularly helpful for, for people chasing WASP, work to all states, because, you know, we all know people with call signs like AA6YQ can live in Massachusetts, um, <laughs> for example. Yes. So, you know, this primary column here for U.S. stations, you know, N2MM is in New Jersey, you know, KM4TVU is in, in Georgia. 
KFC One Lyell is, is in Connecticut. Those aren't you know completely unusual, but you know if you're trying to work Wyoming or Montana or one of the more difficult uh, stations to catch on WAS, being able to see this here is very very helpful. And DX Lab can then use that to highlight the fact that hey, you don't have Pennsylvania confirmed on six meters for WAS. Um, you need to go, go go work that. Yes. Okay. So looking at this filter panel down here. So right now, we're not looking at everything in the spot database. We're only looking at a subset of entries that conform to this filter expression, my band filter, my mode filter, and my origin filter. So some of the active entries are being hidden because I've set it up that way. Now, you know, why would I do that? Well, let's go to slide 21. Here's my band filter. Well, you know, to pick an easy example, spots of stations on 160 meters at midday, even if I need them, are completely useless. There's no way I'm going to work them. Same thing with 80 meters. So while I have 160 meters and 80 meters enabled, I've said, don't start telling me about, don't start showing me 160 meter stations until 30 minutes before my sunset. And don't start and 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 stop showing them to me 45 minutes after my sunrise. And sunrise and sunset are automatically calculated for your QTH every day. So you can see down there in the sunrise sunset panel at the bottom of the window. So you don't have to adjust this. You don't have to every day come in and, and adjust these start and end times. They adjust automatically. You just set what the offsets are. I'm not interested in 60 meters because it doesn't not good for any of the words I pursue. So I don't have it checked. But I've got 40 meters through 10 meters checked. I don't pursue anything on eight meters, but I've got six meters checked. And I've gone one step further and said, don't tell me about any six meter stations where the station, nobody closer than 500 miles from my QTH has spotted them. So this whole concept of max origin DX, which you know we saw in the spot database, what's the closest station that has spotted this station? This critical information. Because on one hand, you know, if P5 is spotted by somebody on the opposite coast of you, that doesn't tell you very much. But the fact that that happened, but also your next door neighbor spotted them, shouldn't stop you from going after it. So knowing how close was the closest spotting station is the key information that tells you whether or not a spot is relevant or not. If it's from a station close to you, it's relevant. If it's from a station far from you, it's just not. And any given DX station could be spotted by 55, 20, 100 different stations. So knowing what the minimum distance is, is critical. Let's move on to slide 22. Here's the mode filter. So I've circled the modes that I've enabled. I've highlighted them in red. So obviously I chase sideband CW and RIDI, and we've already talked about PSK. And I am trying to work um, all 300, all, all 340 DXCC entities on FT8 and FT4. So I have those boxes checked, but I don't want to see spot database entries, active DX stations in any of those other modes. For me, that would be just clutter. Now, some people might say, well, you know, you're not working JST65, but it might give you information about when a station's active or propagation, and that's true. But at my stage in DXing, I don't want to see that. Other operators might have a different uh, conclusion as to what better fits their operating style. But the mode filter makes it easy just by point and click to say what subset of the modes do you want to see active stations operating in. And then in the upper right corner, you can say which, <laughs> this is basically filtering spots from the stations. So if you just don't want to hit any spots, you just want to ignore spots from Europe. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but some operators, they, they feel like I'm in the East Coast of the US. I only want to see spots from stations in the East Coast of the US. Fine, uncheck all these boxes except the NAE box, and you'll only see stations that were spotted from somebody on the US East Coast. Um, you know, that may be your operating style, that's just fine. For me, I want to see spots no matter where they come from because they tell me something about a station's operating pattern, but everybody has a different way of DXing and this supports it. So let's move on to slide 23. So now, looking at the filter panel at the bottom, you see that red highlighted need button. So I click that, and that means only show me active ent database entries for stations with whom a QSO 
uh, a confirmed QSO would advance pro my progress toward the awards I'm pursuing. And we can see that there are five that are highlighted in red, which means uh, unworked. And there's one that's highlighted in blue, which means worked but not confirmed. So the blue one, the S means worked all states. And if you remember from the previous slide, I'm pursuing worked all states on six meters. And at the time I did this, I did not have Pennsylvania confirmed on six meters uh, yet. So that's, uh, it was worked but not confirmed. That's why it's blue. You can also see that I did not have Korea worked even uh, on 30 meters. So that's red um, because of that. Um, and here's this Korea on 30 meters again. Uh, and here's my bogus bouvet spot that I injected here. So it's the same old thing. So the need filter really reduces the clutter. It reduces it down to who's active with whom a QSO would advance your award progress. You know, if you're pursuing marathon, if you're pursuing WAS, this is a real godsend because it just redu it just hides a lot of stuff that won't help you, at least for the moment. On to slide 24. Um, if you want to incorporate the probability of an opening based on a VOA cap forecast, then you can create your own custom filter. You see the need 50 filter. That's one whose contents I filled out. And the contents are shown here in yellow at near the top, need filter and band filter and mode filter and origin filter and SP probability, short path probability greater than 50. So when I do that, when I say, just show me the stuff I need where the probability of me being able to work them is actually greater than 50% right this minute, then I only see the uh, the the opening in Bouvet, which has a 52% probability of an opening. Mm. So this is a way to really focus you down on what's currently QRV that you might actually be able to work. Don't spend time, you know, barking up the wrong tree. Slide 25. So um, when FT8 first showed up in 2017. And you know, I know there's a lot of debate about, um, you know, is FT8 killing amateur radio and all this, that, and the other thing. Um, I was really interested in it. Joe K1JT actually contacted me and asked if I would make, enable um, Commander to be able to support rig control for WSJTX. So he and I had some good uh, uh, discussions together. And his, um, his development manager, Bill uh, G4WJS, who was unfortunately now silent key, Work, and I worked together quite a bit. And I just became really interested because WSJTX is a spot source. You know, if you've got it running and monitoring 20 meters, it's telling you what your station is hearing, what your station is decoding. It's just like a spot source. And you don't ever have to make QSOs on, uh, in FT8 for, F, for that connection to be useful. Um, you, can, you can certainly do so, but... Knowing what your station is hearing an FT8 and where it's hearing it and when it's hearing it is very useful information. So there's basically two different ways to connect um, WSJTX to, uh, to DX Lab, one through JT Alert and one directly. And when you connect it directly, then it acts like a spot source. And you see that the incoming, the column that says network, instead of showing you a DX cluster, it's showing WSJTX. And the source call sign, instead of being the spotting station, is me, my, my station. And now we have some new columns over here. The signal to noise ratio, as decoded by WSJTX. The maximum signal to noise ratio during the time that this station was active between the first time and the last time. And the minimum SNR. So we can actually see how the signal to noise ratio changed during the time that the station was actively being decoded by WSJTX. So again, excellent propagation information that we can use not just to work FT8 stations, but to work other stations in other modes. And I will say, just for the record, in my experience, having gotten to 300 countries in FT8, having DXing in FT8 requires all the same knowledge and skill that uh, DXing in any other mode requires. Got to understand propagation, got to know how to get through a pileup, uh, got to know when to listen and where to listen. So, you know, everybody gets to make their own decisions about what modes they use, and there's nothing ruder than criticizing somebody else's choice of modes. Um, but from my point of view, 
I don't think FT8 is ruining amateur radio. I think it's expanding it. And I think it'll, it, it will not be the last technological improvement like this. I mean, you know, we went through the same transition when we went from Spark to CW, when we went from uh, AM to sideband, when we went from transceivers, excuse me, from tubes to transistors to integrated circuits and computers. So, you know, given my background, it's not surprising that I would have that orientation, but uh, I'm thrilled with what, what uh, uh, Joe uh, K1JT did, and I think it's really expanding amateur radio. On to slide 26. So, Joe, you asked me the question, um, you know, do I get notification when something I need is active? And yeah. the answer is yes. And if we go to, that's, that's the, uh, the sound view and the email view that are, are depicted in the bottom of slide 26. We go on to slide 27. Uh, you can arrange it so that when a, a new entry is added to the, the active DX database for a needed DX station, the station you need, a confirmation uh, or of a QSO would advance your award progress. You can get an audio announcement call sign, counter, band mode. Um, counter is whether it's DXCC or state or whatever. And optionally, you can have an email, outgoing email message, which you can use to initiate a text message. So there are DX Lab users who are out there mowing their lawns with their smartphones. And you know when uh, something happens that they need to attend to, they get a message on their smartphone and off they go back into the shack uh, to work whatever it is that they need. The, the, I have to tell the Joe DX story. So um, <laughs> one of the early one of the early DX Lab users, I forget his call sign, shame on me, uh, he's a great guy. He has a, is a trained announcer with a trained voice. And he announced, he basically recorded all of the words that were needed to make this work. So he recorded 10 meters and 20 meters, every band, every mode, every DXCC entity, every state, um, you know, all that stuff, and then DX Lab, you know, sequences them together. So there's a, an operator, Jerry K3BC, basically had this audio piped out onto his patio. So that when he was outside doing whatever he was doing, he could hear these, these announcements. Well, his wife and kids were out there too. And they took to call in the voice, Joe DX. And that stuck. So <laughs> as a result, um, you know, there's and 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 the announcer, the guy who did the announcement, was thrilled with it, and he recorded lots of Joe DX announcements. So uh, and those are all delivered with spot collectors. So you can have a blast listening to to Joe DX, and it's very special when North Korea gets spotted. Yes, because, it is. Um, there's a very special audio announcement of of North Korea. I'm not going to preview it, but trust me, it's worth it. Uh, it's pretty cool to work North Korea. Okay, on to slide 28. So now we're going to look at yet another view of Active EX, and that's a world map view. So here's all of the active stations plotted such that you can see the spotting station as a small black dot and the spotted station, the active station, as a red dot. So you can see you know, lots of red dots, lots of lines. That kind of gives you a sense of propagation openings. You can see you know, who's talking to who. Now, this is multiple bands. This is all bands at once. If you want, you can just say, oh, I just want to see it on 160 meters. And now we're looking at slide 30. So on slide 30, we're only seeing uh, who's spotting who on 160 meters. And as you might imagine, it's all darkness or uh, gray line kind of stuff. So, you know, uh, somebody in Spain is working somebody in Japan uh, just past sunset or sunrise in Japan. Mm -hmm. hmm. So um, this is very useful for visualizing stuff. It's nice for visualizing gray line. And as I mentioned earlier, there's actually a capability to compute uh, gray lines. You'll see that in a bit. Okay, the next view, slide 31, is the um, band pass view. Um, so this is a band spread. You can see uh, my transceiver is currently on 14080. You can see the red dot, the red line there in the middle. and all of the stations within the spread, within the range of this uh, band spread, are the, the call signs are there. They're highlighted using the same color scheme that is used in the main window of, of Spot Collector and the tabular view. Namely, if somebody was needed, they'd be highlighted in red font. Uh, the yellow background means they QSL via Logbook of the World. The pink background means they QSL via EQSL. And the blue background means they QSL via both. So as you're tuning around, you know, you can you can listen and see, you know, who that is, get some idea of what the identification is. 
Uh, you can also manually add stations to this. And, uh, that's a recommended practice again from uh, Bob uh, W9KNI, so that when you hear a state, you're patrolling the band looking for something, and you hear a station and it hasn't been spotted yet, you don't necessarily have to spot it. You can just insert it into your uh, Active DX database and it'll appear here. So the next time you tune across it, you won't have to wait for that station to identify. You'll know who it is. So again, cutting down the, the uh, temporal clutter. Okay, uh, moving on to slide 33. This is really cool. I love this. So ICOM, starting with the 7300, made it possible uh, through just a CAT connection for applications like uh, DX Lab, Commander in this case, to obtain spectrum data from the radio. So we take that spectrum data and we display it. We create a waterfall display down at the bottom. Um, we give you uh, the ability to zoom and pan around that waterfall. And, you know, all the same call signs that you just saw in the band spread window can appear here uh, uh, above the uh, frequency display. And as you tune around and tune over a station, you can see exactly who it is. But now you can actually see their plot in the waterfall or in the spectrum display. So here's an example. P5DX is in red because I need P5 uh, in uh, whatever mode that is. I guess that's must it must be CW. It is. It's down at the bottom of 80 meters. Um, but the uh, the angle brackets mean that was a an entry that I made. So that was not a spot. That was not something that came in through the cluster network. I inserted that because I tuned across and said, oh, that's P5DX. I, you know, I'll just make sure that's in the database. Okay. So moving now to uh, slide 35, we'll come to the view that for working the DX you need and finding the DX you need, this is probably the most powerful view there is. Um, and strangely, many people don't find it or don't become aware of it, which is why I'm so anxious to do these presentations. Because this view lets you look at the data in all those databases in an incredibly useful way. Go to slide 36. By graphing frequency versus time of day across a 24-hour day. So you can see when stations are active and where they're active. Now, this is a looking at everything view, so it's maybe impressive graphically. Very soon, we're going to see how to use this to find and work the DX we need. But what this basically is, is an analysis of all the data in the database or some subset of the database that we specify uh, showing when and where stations have been active. Okay. Um, slide 37. This is uh, the WSJTX view. So I mentioned that, uh, go to the slide 38, you can directly connect WSJTX as a spot source. When you do there, that, it's not just a one-way connection. It's not just that what you decode ends up as a spot source going into your active spot database, but we actually color code the call signs in the WSJTX band activity panel in the same way that we color code them every place else. So at the time I did this, I did not have VU worked on, on FT8. So the several VU call signs are shown highlighted in red. Also, I didn't have LY worked yet either. And you have the same background colors, um, uh, yellow for LOTW, pink for uh, EQSL, and light blue for both of them. So again, we're able to see needed call signs and uh, participation in logbook and EQSL in our WSJTX band activity panel. And the integration is such that if you log a QSO here, it will end up directly in DX Keeper. So if you've already worked them on this band, on this mode, how does that show up? So it depends. If, if, if DXCC is entity bands and entity modes. So if you're pursuing DXCC, there is no need to work a, a DXCC entity in each combination of band and mode. Right. WAS, however, you can do that. So you can say, I want to work, you know, every WAS zone in every combination of band and mode, and that would be highlighted here in the same way. So the font, the font would be red to indicate that, hey, you need, you know, AA9SJ, you know, for WAS, uh, his zone and his band. And CQ Marathon was what I had in mind as I'm looking. It, it, well, it works fine for CQ Marathon, same thing. Okay. So anything anything needed based on that one panel set of that one tab in DX Keeper where you identify these are my these are, this is what I'm pursuing, then that drives the color coding in all of these applications. 
Hmm. So you, you only have to specify your objectives one place, and that's in, in the logging application. And that drives everything else. OK, so slide 39, we have completed our tour of multiple views of ActiveDx. We've seen all of these views and what they do. And now, going to slide 40, we're going to transition to finding the DX you need and working the DX you need using the mechanisms that we just reviewed. So let's go to slide 41. So the first thing I did to kick this off, this is the tabular view of the, of the ActiveDx database. And down at the bottom, which I can't see because of the Zoom stuff, but there's a um, filter panel, and I clicked the Need button. So this is showing me everything that's currently QRB that I need. And there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, a lot of interesting targets, three whiskey, five whiskey, nine mic, um, ZC4. But if you look in the mode column, almost all of it is FT8 because of my penchant for wanting to work everything with FT8. So given that I'm still pursuing DXCC and WAS and other stuff, arguably my FT8 objective is obscuring my objectives for the other awards. I can't see, you know, yeah, I could painstakingly go through this. Oh, look, here's, you know, here's, here's EZWS on uh, 80 meter CW. I could painstakingly go through it there. But what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to bring up my mode filter and uncheck the FT8 box. I'm on slide 42. So I brought up the mode filter. I unchecked the FT8 box. And now the need filter automatically, I didn't have to click it again. It's suddenly reduced to these 10 or so or 12 or so entries, because now I'm not seeing anything from FT8. I, I disabled that by unchecking the FT8 box in the mode filter. I didn't delete those from the spot database. They're still there, and I can turn them back on again when I want to. But for my purposes right now, I just want to know what's active that might advance my progress on DXCC or WAS or the other awards I'm pursuing. And I see that there's some stuff here. But as I painstakingly go through these entries, you know, easy one WS isn't valid for DXCC. Um, v, trying to work VK1000 on uh, uh, 80 meter sideband, that's not going to happen with, with my antenna. I have an inverted L on 160. Um, I have to work that in, in CW. Um, and the rest of these stations are on 80 and 160, and they're after my sunrise. So basically, right now, there's nothing going on in any of these other modes. Uh, that I really need to attend to. So now I'm going to go back and check the FT8 box again. I'm on slide 43 and look at all this stuff. And, you know, I look at all these stations that are active and what catches my eye down here at the bottom are these ZC4 spots. ZC4 is the uh, sovereign, what is it? It's a British base on Cyprus. Right. Yes. Um, and it's not active very often. So whereas all these things are cool things to work, these other stations in FT8, this one might not be around for long. So, um, so I'm going to look into this a little bit more. So why do I need it? Um, this is in Spot Collector. I right-click the entry, and it tells me why ZC4GR is, is highlighted in red. So you can do this for any active DX entry that's shown as needed. Tell me why it's needed. You know, is it needed for DXCC? Is it needed for WAS? Is it needed for WAS? And it says digital status not worked, sought. So I'm seeking it. Um, but it's not worked. That's why it's needed. I can go one step further. I'm on slide 45, and I can look at the real-time award tracking. These are the awards across the top that that, um, that we provide real-time award tracking for, and we've selected the DXCC tab, and we've scrolled to the row for ZC4. As we look across, we can see that there's Vs, which means DXCC award credit granted. There's Vs the whole way across, except in two places. The, the FT8 column is empty because I haven't worked this guy in FT8. I haven't worked ZC4 in FT8. And six meters column is empty because I haven't yet worked uh, ZC4 in six meters. Someday we'll have an F2 opening on six meters and I will live to see it. And I will get to workstations like ZC8 on, <laughs> on six meters. Um, but in my 30 years, I've yet to see six meters open worldwide. So that's that's uh, a joy I, I hope to see coming this uh, September and October given the high solar flux. And down here at the bottom, we can also see, you know, when we look at ZC4 uh, with the modes uh, in, as rows and bands as columns, the FT8 row is completely empty because I haven't worked F, uh, ZC4 and FT8 on any, on any band. So onto slide 46, 
Now, this is the first time you've seen um, uh, Pathfinder. So Pathfinder uh, is an application that's really a specialized web browser. So, you know, we don't do as much QSL routing, root hunting as we used to because of logbook and, and EQSL and QRZ. Um, but, you know, we just, there's still some stations where you need to get a QSL card to get a confirmation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you tried to do that using, you know, your favorite web browser, you had to type in the call sign and then, you know, type in a path that you basically had to go visit 20 different websites to find, look for path for, um, for QSL routes. So what I did instead is I said, okay, let's make it so that we can enter a call sign once. And you see ZC4GR is highlighted in red there. And let's provide 12 searches. And for each of these buttons, you can specify how to go about searching for QSL information for this call sign that you specified, in this case, ZC4GR. So when I type in ZC4GR and click, click the buck button, then I'm gonna get a Buckmaster call book update in this window below. If I click the QRZ button without having changed the call sign, then I get a QRZ lookup. I can do a Google search. I can look at K2 DSL sites, IK, IK3 QAR sites. These are always changing. Here's HamQTH, here's Clublog. So you can basically query to get information about a call sign, having only entered the call sign one time. And when we do that for ZC4GR, we can learn some things. So here, I don't have a QSO to get a confirmation. I'm here looking for hints about how to work this guy. And guess what? There are some. First, he says, I mainly operate FT8. Well, that's a clue. He says, my station is an FT450, which is my rain radio. So right away, we know he's probably limited to 100 watts. He doesn't have an amplifier. Later on, he says, he's using a Vine City Wyndham antenna. So he's using a wire antenna. Not using a beam, not using a cubic, cubicle quad. So the signals are not going to be strong. 100 watt rig, wire antenna, um, not going to be not going to be strong signals. And then he tells us what bands he's QRV. So we know exactly where it makes sense to look. No, no, no point spending time on 80 or 10 because he's not going to be there. So good information here on the QRZ page. On to slide 47. So here what I've done. At the very bottom, I've typed in the prefix in the filter panel, the prefix ZC4, mm -hmm. and I click the DXCC button. That means show me all entries in the DXCC in the active DX database for stations in ZC4 in the uh, UK sovereign basis. And the only station that's active there, they're <laughs> all ZC4GR, every single one of them. Yep. Um, and, you know, here we have a gazillion entries, 43 entries. Look at the very top. You see there's 43 entries here of times that ZC4GR was found to be active. You know, some of them are very short. Here's, you know, the first one, 15, started at 1519, ended at 1538. The next one, 1943 to 1943, 1628 to 1628. Then 1741 to 1825. You can see that there are various spans of activity that were spotted. And a whole bunch of different bands that he was spotted on 15, 30, 20, 10. The CQ zone, you know, is always 20, because that's where the, that's where ZC4 is. Look at these seven columns or eight columns for geography. Mm -hmm. Almost all of the spots come from stations in Europe. Yeah. But look at the second most active column is Asia. So this guy's mostly being spotted by stations in Europe and Asia. Look at the NAE column. That's where I am. There's only been two occasions where there, where somebody from the North American East Coast has detected him. But wait, look at this one, this one here in the middle. Scroll over to the right, and the ODX is zero. That's me. There's a there's a, a minimum SN, SNR and a maximum SNR. So my station actually decoded ZC4GR because I leave it running on 20 meters, you know, on the 23rd at, at I get the right row here. Yeah, the 23rd at 1229. I decoded him starting at 12. He This is the whole span, but somewhere in this span between 1229 and 2136, my station decoded him at least once. So that's a cool thing. I discovered that I actually, had I been at sitting in my station at the time, I might have been able to work him. And here's another low ODX down here. Here's one where the ODX is 86. This again corresponds to a yes in the North American East Coast column. So 
on two occasions, stations on in the East Coast actually decoded ZC4GR in 20 meters. Hmm. So, you know, on to slide 48, let's look at that with the magic propagation view. So now we're seeing the data in a really useful format because it's showing us graphically when ZC4GR was QRV and where. So we can see that, yeah, he did show up, or at least he was spotted a couple of times on 10 meters, but and he was spotted at least once on 12 meters, but you know, there's not a lot to go on here. A little more activity on 15 meters, you know, during this hour, he was actually spotted three times. But look at 20, he never showed up on 17. Look at 20 meters, you know, yeah. quite a bit of activity on 20 meters, starting as early as 12 Zulu and ending around 23 Zulu. It's also quite active on 30 meters, you know. And he was quite active on a little bit less active on 40. So this right away tells us his operating pattern. What does ZC4GR, when does he typically show up on the air and where does he show up? This greatly narrows down where we have to go looking to find him. So this is a huge step forward in terms of finding the DX you need because it tells you when and where to look. But the other part of it is we have to worry about propagation. So, you know, looking at, now I'm on slide 49, I'm now zeroing in on those two occasions where stations on the North American East Coast actually spotted ZC4GR, including me. Now going to slide 50, we're gonna drill down. And even though <laughs> the spot database, there's one entry for ZC4GR um, when he was uh, QRV from 1229, to 20, whatever this is down here at the bottom. It was a long time. The spot, the active database actually records all of the spots of that station in that entry, every last one of them. Now, there were so many, I couldn't fit them all on the screen. But so this is one, this is the, this is what contributed to that one entry for ZC4GR that I happen to be contributing to. And you can actually see here, at 20, 1746, DEAA6YQ, I decoded ZC4GR calling UR5QBB saying RR73. Hmm. So all of these spots, including mine from my instance of WSGTX, were contributing to that entry. And I've, I've highlighted a couple here. Here's the first one. The first time I decoded it was at 1730. And the last time I decoded it was 2129, just before he went QRT. So this is all of those entries. Go to slide to the next slide, 51, and we'll do it for the other occasion in which somebody on the North American East Coast actually heard him and spotted him on 20 meters. And we can see that there were actually two different stations that did that. K1JX uh, did it um, at 2239, and W4IL spotted him several times between 2310 and 2340. And you can see the signal-to-noise ratios that were spotted. So again, more clues as to his activity pattern. Let's go to slide 52. We said that propagation is important. So what was propagation like on the two times that East Coast stations heard ZC4GR, one on the 23rd and one on the 30th of the month? Well, Spot Collector collects WWV spots. So this is something that many hams don't know. And that is that the Telnet clusters convey WWV spots. And those WWV spots contain important information, the solar flux, the A index, and the K index. The solar flux tells us how active the stream of ions coming out of the sun are, and therefore how much ionization there is and how reflective the layers of the ionosphere will be. The A index and K index are measures of geomagnetic instability. The higher they are, the more disturbed conditions are, and the less likely we are to be able to, to enjoy band openings. So if we look at the solar flux on those two days, the 23rd and the 30th, we see that on the 23rd, the solar flux was started out at 80 and dropped down about 76. Well, that's, you know, that's not an unusually high solar flux. It's not like the reason this was open because the flux was out of this world. I mean, this flux is around 200 today as I as we I, we're speaking. So it was not unusually high solar flux on either of these days. And if we look at the geomagnetic A index, uh, on the 23rd, it rose a little bit from four to 12. Getting into the 16, 20, 30 area, that gets to be nasty. But 
but it wasn't di very disruptive here and neither was it very disruptive on the 30th. So the solar flux was sort of okay, but not unusual on those two days. Data for our search. On to slide 53. I mentioned that uh, DXU has the ability to calculate future long, uh, excuse me, future gray line openings between your QTH and some spot you select. So I said, okay, you know, select UK Cyp uh, the UK military bases on Cyprus, that here's the latitude and longitude. To get this, all I had to do was click on, to, to enter ZC4 was enough to do it, or just click on the world map. You didn't have to type in this, you know, this, this specific lat line. You can if you want, but it's point and click if you want. And guess what? No, no grade line openings. So that's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Okay, let's go to slide 54. So now we're looking at PropView, uh, which is a, the propagation forecasting component of DX Lab, which uses the BOA Cap engine. BOA Cap is a something that the government built over many years. It started out uh, with the Ion Cap engine, and then it turned it into the VO Cap engine, VOA Cap engine. It basically has a model of the ionosphere with a lot of parameters, and it uses that to be able to predict the amount of signal loss between two locations on Earth based on ionospheric ref reflections. And the output of BOA cap is a whole bunch of, of tables, basically tables and tables of numbers showing bands and, and, and signal to noise ratios and times of day. And you can use it if you want, but it, trying, to, trying to figure it out is a pain. So early on, I, I invented PropView, which basically does this nice display, frequency on one axis, time of day on the other axis. So this is UTC on the horizontal axis, frequency on the vertical axis, and you've got megahertz on the left side and amateur radio bands on the right side. Um, the red dot next to 40 meters means that when I did this, my transceiver happened to be on 40 meters. Uh, Prop, you got that information from Commander. Um, down below, you can see that there, where it says U and DX, that's a graphical representation of time of day. So from 0Z to 9Z, I'm in darkness. Uh, then my twilight um, uh, is uh, between 9 and 10 Zulu. And then it's sunshine uh, all day until 23 Zulu when the sun sets. Uh, DX is the same thing, but this is DX in this case is ZC4. So you can see, you know, he his... His sunset occurs much earlier than mine, and his sunrise occurs much earlier than mine. Why is this important? Well, on the low bands, there's no propagation unless you have common darkness or at least common twilight. So here I know that there's common darkness between me and ZC4 from basically 23 Zulu to about 2 Zulu, maybe 3 Zulu. Um, and that's it for common darkness. So low bands uh, is going to be really challenging. And you can see there's not much shown here in the propagation opening for on the low bands. Now, the, the, what the representation here is, the thicker the line, the higher the probability of an opening. So 80 meters here, pretty low probability. It's a little thicker here, then thins out, and it's gone with my with uh, when sunrise hits uh, Cyprus. Um, but if you look at these other bands, 20 meters is open most of the day. And if you let your mouse cursor hover over any one time, it will give you the actual propagation prediction and the probability of an opening, and it will tell you the characteristics of the opening. In this case, it's two bounces on the F2 layer. Hmm. So you can actually, so what, what this does is it renders the propagation forecast in a form that's easy to see, and that's what this is all about. So what this is showing me is, hey, yeah, there's some good propagation openings between my QTH and, and Cyprus, or the military bases on Cyprus, at least as VOA cap predicts it. You know, some good openings on 20 meters, some good openings on 30 meters, a little bit less on 40 meters. Um, 17 looks viable. 15 might even be open. So PropView has pre pretty optimistic about when we might be able to work this guy. Okay, let's uh, move to uh, slide 55. So now we're going to talk about checking actual propagation as opposed to forecast propagation. There's a couple ways to do that. So we'll start by looking, this is the DX Atlas map that uh, DXView can also interoperate with. So here, I've used this to show what ZC4 is close to. So ZC4 is on the eastern edge of Cyprus, 5B, this is ZC4. And you can see it's kind of surrounded by Turkey up, up north, Syria to the east, Lebanon to the east, OD, 4Z, Israel to the southeast, JY is a little further to the southeast. 
Palestine to the southeast, um, and then Egypt to the south. So these are the countries that kind of surround um, uh, uh, Cyprus. So the first thing we're going to look at is, are there any propagation beacons near there? So for those of you who aren't familiar with propagation beacons, these are another great resource for DXers. The Northern California DX Foundation, NCDXF, operates 18 propagation beacons. So here are the call signs. So there's one in Sri Lanka, there's one at the UN, there's one in Israel, one in Kenya, uh, one in Portugal, Japan, I won't read them all. Um, and each one of those at a certain time will broadcast successively 10 seconds of call sign on these frequencies. And when it broadcasts, it does it at three different power levels. So you can get a sense for, if you basically say, okay, I wanna know, you know whether I've got an opening to Peru so you tune to the frequency at the right time and listen on a particular band and see whether or not you can hear the beacon. Well, in this case, there's a beacon in Israel, which is only 230 miles away from ZC4. And so PropView's beacon monitor knows exactly when the 4X6TU beacon will be QRV on each of these bands. And if you push this QSY button, then PropView will actually command commander to QSY your radio to each of these frequencies at the exact right time for you to be able to see whether or not you can hear the beacon at 4X6TU at that time. So it's a great way to check actual propagation to something near the DX you need to work. And yeah, with 18 propagation vehicles, pretty good, pretty useful. I, I use this often. Um, it's actually even fun just to enable it and watch it, to be honest. It is. It can be entertaining. Yeah. But, you have to remember, here's a clue. Remember to uncheck the QSY box when you're done. Because yeah. otherwise, you'll come down to your radio the next morning, it'll be merrily QSYing away, and you'll wonder what took over your, your computer. <laughs> it, trust me, it's happened more than once. <laughs> On to slide 57. Okay, so here's a second way to check actual propagation between my QTH and Cypress ZC4. Namely, I can ask, Looking in the spot database, who near me has been spotting stations near ZC4? So to do that, I'm going to define another custom filter. Remember, I defined, designed a custom filter to show me needed stations that I had a better than 50% chance of opening. Now I'm going to say, I want to see all active stations that are in one of these DXCC entities, ZC4 itself, the, the rest of Cyprus, Turkey, Lebanon, Israel, Egypt that were spotted by stations that were less than 500 miles from my QTH. So the way I say that in filter language, which is structured query language, um, which is a, a, an industry standard, um, I say DXCC prefix is in this list, one of the members of this list, and ODX is less than 500. So this is an expression that basically limits what I see to just entries that conform to this expression. Now, right away, I see eyes rolling up. SQL, I got to learn SQL to use this? Well, one of the things that has surprised me the most about this is how many people who, who basically barely can turn their computers on have been able to figure out how to use this language to be able to filter either their logs or their uh, ActiveDX databases to get what they want. You know, it starts out with, hey, I, I don't know how to do this. Could somebody give me a filter to do that? And people in the DX Lab Reflector are happy to give you a filter. Well, once you collect two or three of them, you see the pattern, you see the syntax, you see the semantics, and you begin to say, oh, I can modify this to do what I want. Six months later, you're posting your SQL expressions on the uh, uh, DX Lab Reflector group to help new hams. So, and, and, and the rumor that I get paid by the SQL Association for creating new SQL developers is completely false. <laughs> anyway, so here's this expression that says, show me all stations near me within 500 miles of my QTH that have spotted stations in these DXCC entities. And now here's what we get in the tabular view. Mm. Lots of stuff. You know, stations in, in Z, here's ZC4GR itself. Here's Israel, Turkey, lots of stations. Once again, how do I make sense of all this data? Not with this view. I go to the propagation view, slide 59. So now I can see visually the propagation openings between my QTH 
in the area of the world that's Cyprus and the, and the countries around it. I can see that, you know, there's a spot on six meters. I sort of doubt that. That's probably a, a misty code or something. There was one spot, one on 17 meters. Look at 20 meters. You know, it really peaks up uh, around 23 Zulu. Um, not much on 30 meters. Yeah. Not much on 40 meters. So looking at this, I mean, you can see the propagation openings here. Um, 20 meters looks like the band. And this time frame uh, looks like the time to, to do it. So um, this is really... This is probably the most helpful helpful slide in the deck because it's showing me when I have propagation to the DX station I want to work. Well, now going to slide sixty, we can compare that forecast with the uh, that that VOA cap produced with the actual that we get off of um, active stations. So this is kind of a sanity check. How reasonable is our actual data? Well, it corresponds pretty well. Now I have to admit when you look at this that I have prop view configured to be pretty optimistic. So in terms of takeoff angles and other stuff, I make it because I don't want to miss an opportunity because I made prop view too pessimistic. So, you know, this is probably a little bit more aggressive than reality and everybody can configure it however they want to configure it. But you can see that there's a pretty good correlation between what prop view shows in terms of thick lines that indicate a good opening and what we're seeing on the right in terms of the actual propagation that we get based on what stations are actually spotting. Okay, so let's go to the next slide, which is 61. So now we can say, all right, let's compare and contrast. When is it that ZC4GR is QRV? That's the first set of numbers. And when are there, is there propagation between my QTH and his? There's another set of numbers. And guess what? There's some overlap. And the overlap is shown in yellow, namely the overlap between 12 and 23 Zulu. Now, the biggest opening is between 20 and 23 Zulu or even 20 and 22 Zulu. But you get the idea. Now we're looking at the intersection between when's the active and when do I have propagation? It doesn't get any better than that in terms of finding and working the DX you need. Because now you know exactly when and where to look. So what's the strategy? Monitor the 20, 20 meter FT8 subband between 19 Zulu and 23 Zulu, especially when the solar flux is at least at 75, and especially when we can copy the North American DX Foundation 4X beacon on 20 meters. You know, that tells us how to focus our effort on working ZC4GR. And that's really, that's that's the prize. That's where this presentation has led us. So the good news going to slide 62 is a couple weeks later, uh, on uh, uh, August 14th of 2021, I caught him calling CQ. So this is the this is the raw spot. There he was calling CQ from KM65, and I decoded him working some other stations. And then finally at 2034, he called me. Um, Called me with a signal to noise rate, gave me a zero a minus zero two. So I worked them. And here's, you know, here's the entry. I'm on slide 63 now. Here's the entry in WSJTX showing, you know, uh him calling me. And here, here it is prompting me to log the QSO and slide 64. When did it happen? It happened at uh 23 Zulu, right in the middle of the sweet spot where we said to look. So as predicted, that's where we caught him. And looking at slide 65, we knew that he QSL via logbook of the world. So later that day, there's my confirmation for UK bases on Cyprus. So uh, slide 66, we've completed the agenda as we laid it out. Um, we, we went through an introduction. We talked about finding the DX you need and working the DX you need. Um, slide 67, uh, if you go to dxlabsuite.com, You'll see all this entry level information in terms of you know how to figure out what it is and where it is and what things happen. Um, slide sixty eight. It's all free. You know I don't charge for anything. I do this because I love it. I enjoy it. It's my way of giving back to a hobby that's given me enormous pleasure. Um, and I like to encourage other DXers and I'd like to encourage you give it a try. Um, slide sixty nine. Final screenshot. Slide seventy. We're done. Um, I, I was I didn't want to interrupt you, but 
Uh, that's not the first station you've done that for, because I recall you did a presentation on tracking Mount Athos pretty much the same way. I do, I've done Mount Athos that way, and I did uh, uh, South Korea on 30 meters. So I've, I've been doing presentations for radio clubs originally in person, so that kind of limited me to Visalia, and, and I did Dayton one year, and I did a bunch of radio clubs here in the New England area. But since everybody started using Zoom, I'm able to do uh, radio club presentations you know, in other parts of the world. So and anybody who's got a radio club that would like to see this presentation, I'm happy to deliver it. Um, and and I would I would coach everyone too. I mean, when you look at the whole thing, it's like, oh my God, look at all that to get where you. But it's really not. It, it's a very logical approach. It's one step to the next step to the next step, and and um, it it's really fun. It's really fun to go through and find that. And then when you work them, it's like bingo, you know, we're done. So yeah, really cool. <clears throat> very very uh, informative. I've I've never seen so much presentation on a uh, logging program oh my god yes yeah we haven't even talked about printing your own qsl cards and all those special reports you can generate and uh yes um well another we'll need another three hours for that one yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah no this was just outstanding uh, uh dave well it was my pleasure i really enjoyed it and i hope people get a lot out of it um you know the uh the DX Lab uh, discussion group is free and open, and we welcome all users. Just you know, as long as you're friendly, uh, you can ask any old question you want. Uh, provide as much advice as you can, and join the DXing community there. Very cool, Joe. Mm -hmm. Did I miss anything? Well, we covered this. Uh, Dave covered it very, very thoroughly, and you asked the right questions, uh, uh, Bill. It's just Job well done by both of you guys. It's just really cool. I have a lot of respect for him, a lot of respect for the software and uh, having used it for a long time, it's, it's, and I'm always, always learning all kinds of new stuff. So um, is there, a, is there a, uh, um, any, you know, the, the buzzword right now for everybody, Dave, is AI. Um, as you look down the road, and I know you don't like to talk about software enhancements. And one of the things I actually did appreciate about Rational is when I was out representing the company, I never once talked about vaporware or close your eyes. It's really going to work like this. They did a good job. Of, we just presented what we had. That was John Lovett. I mean, Lovett and Rapid both said, we want to sell what we have. Um, you know, we do not want to fall into the trap of uh, selling futures because that just makes revenue recognition a disaster. So, you know, um, against, I mean, I certainly am very comfortable with that. I think Paul and Mike probably, you know, would have been more aggressive, but Love It and Rapith really helped line. And I think that really helped us because it forced us to make products that we could publicly release. Um, I only wish that I had uh, fulfilled my, uh, what I now know, which is to not ship products with any defects in them. You know, you got to get to zero defects, not zero severe defects. Right. Um, but, but that being said... So I, I, I know that's where you came from. I, that's the approach I, I appreciated then. But I'm, I'm going to give you a crystal ball. What what else could you possibly do with the software that's, that is two, not, years, I mean, two yeah. years from now, we're going to have this again, and Joe and I are going to be like, oh, my God. That the is enhancements crazy. lists are mile long. I mean, there's – Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, there, there, I mean, there's just a lot of – there's a lot of stuff. The stuff on the enhancements list tends to be very low level. Like, for example, IOTA now has a by band award. Please support that. Because originally IOTA was just, you know, you work the island or you don't, not a work the island on each of end bands. There's a lot of stuff like that. There's always new radios to support. I would love to apply um, AI pattern recognition to CW and to CW decoding and just to see, because it's a limited vocabulary um, and just see how long does it take to train uh, an AI engine, you know, an AI model to decode CW and see if we could get one that decodes as well as humans decode in the face of North noise, given the limited amateur radio back vocabulary in each of, you know, N languages. Um, so that would be a fun project. I mean, I can decode CW in my head um, so it's not like I need it, um, right. but but still it would be, I think it would be fun to do. Um, 
so, so that that's one area where AI would make sense. You know, having AI an AI engine connected to the spot database where you could just ask it questions directly instead of having to type in SQL, you could say, when and where should I look for ZC4GR? And it would go through that whole analysis I just did and say, oh, 20 meters from 19 Zulu to 23 Zulu. That right? There's yeah. there's nothing I just did that an AI engine couldn't do if a, a suitably trained. And yeah. it's actually a small domain of discourse. I mean, you know, we're not talking about having to throw the whole internet through it to train it. Pretty crazy. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, you know how much I appreciate your time. I, I truly do. And and I appreciate you working with us. And uh, this has just been great. Oh, that was fun. I, I you know, <laughs> I was never a presenter before I went to Rational. I mean, as an engineer at Data General, I became a manager. I led, you know, the microproducts group. I designed microprocessors. I never stood up in front of customers, not once, until I got to Rational. And the first couple of times I did it, I was terrible. Um, I mean, I had the faintest idea about how to go about doing pre presentations. And, you know, the good news is there were some people at Rational who were quite good at it. Mike Devlin was very good at it. Joe Morasco, very good at it. And instead of shitting on me, like what happened in most companies, they helped me. They coached me. They gave me feedback. They gave me constructive feedback. And then when the internet became available and I could read how other people present and the techniques other people use, you know, I became, I love doing presentations. You know, to me, you know, the point is a presentation isn't your story. It's the illustration of your story. So the idea is to come up with a great story that captures people's attention and then illustrate it with great graphics that, you know, make your points really clear. And I, I, you know, it's a little hard to do that with this because there's so much detail, right. but I hope that the story is interesting that, you know, that there's some, that there's a plot and there's a plot arc. Uh, and, you know, that the, the goal here is find and work the DX you need. And, you know, we started at the beginning and we actually got to the point where we did that. Yeah. So. And, and that's the important part is that you can end up, with, you know, end up with the, here's the confirmation and off we go, you know, yeah. that, that brings it all back home. So exactly. Well done. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay i mean but you know that's that's part of it this isn't this isn't trivial i mean you know the, the odds are though knowing me i would do all of this and miss the zc4 and the guy up the street who just got his license would just throw his radio on and work him in the afternoon but he that's called, what makes it fun yeah he called cq yeah. zc4 gr came back came right back to him yeah i'm sure i'm sure it's happened yep yeah my goodness really great to meet you and yeah, I really same, appreciate your help with this. Yeah, same here, Dave. This has been very interesting, and I've enjoyed uh, all three hours of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll see right, you. On the, I'll see you on the band. Well, you're you're you've seen it twice, so you should be capable of giving it now. Yeah. He does. He yeah. Does. Really. He doesn't. I'll tell you, he doesn't give himself enough credit. He's more than he's more than capable of doing this. Good. It's well, cool. let, let me know how it goes. You don't yeah, need I, Yes, I will. License for me. You've got the slides. There you yeah, go. There, there you go. And well, he'll thanks. give you a he'll give you a free copy, Joe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, guys. Yeah. Thanks again. All right, guys. Enjoyed it. Have a good evening. Okay. Okay. See you. Bye bye. Thanks, good night. Good night. Was that interesting or what? Thank you for joining us on this edition of the DX Mentor. I would like to thank our sponsors, ICOM America, The Daily DX, DX Engineering, and the Southwest Ohio DX Association. You won't find anyone more committed to DX than these sponsors. I would especially like to thank our guests today, Joe, W-A-G-E-X, and Dave, A-A-6-Y-Q. Please check the show notes for some of the items that we've discussed. I would love to have your feedback, answer your questions, and provide help with any DX or amateur radio related issues that you may have. If you need clarification on something or you just have a question, email me at thedxmentor at gmail.com. Drop me a line if you've achieved an all-time new one, receive recognition, or you have a DX event that you would like us to mention. We would be happy to do that. If you're enjoying these DX Mentor episodes, please hit the subscribe button. You can also click like, and if you found this one particularly interesting, I'd like you to share it. If you really have no interest, that's okay. But drop me a note and let me know why and that you at least stop by. I'd appreciate it. Well, 7-3 for this episode, and thanks to my XYL Karen for her love and support. I hope to see you in the pileups.